A private hedge fund called Archegos collapsed last month after borrowing billions from banks to make risky bets on stocks. Now the banks are out billions of dollars. How concerned are you that the financial system is blundering into the same kind of opaque, risky bets that led to the Great Recession in 2008? So it was a, it was a risk management breakdown and one that we're looking very uh, carefully at uh, to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. One that you do not expect to see repeated. Uh, I would say that, you know, we're, we're determined to understand what happened and make sure that, that whatever happened doesn't happen again. Today is Wednesday, April 14th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. We are still in the battle of themes, the two different routes the market is debating taking. One of these routes, one of these themes will be the predominant theme for 2021. In this channel, we continue to support the thesis that the market will choose the way of higher yields and appreciating value inflationary and reopening stocks due to the macro outlook supporting higher inflation and in turn higher yields. Therefore, my stance has been to buy the dips in the inflationary trade and fade the rips in the growth mania and technology names but specifically the high multiple names once again because the macroeconomic outlook indicating higher inflation therefore higher yields and these high multiple stocks with rich valuations will have to be corrected the market yesterday decided to take the way of high growth stay at home and technology stocks due to the upsetting news from johnson and johnson's vaccine yet i told you yesterday that i'm not taking the market move seriously or do i think that it is sustainable and the reason is yes the negative news from johnson and johnson's vaccine dampen the vaccine slash reopening optimism but it does not remove it off the table at all matter of fact it is barely a dent a unnoticeable one and the reason is the abundance of supply from the pfizer and moderna vaccines and therefore i am sticking to the playbook long financials energy materials industrials and some defensives and shorting the richly valued companies in the technology stayed home and momentum trade and today we saw the market reverting back to the same playbook it has been following since the beginning of the year of appreciating financials industrials energy materials while fading the richly valued companies specifically in the nasdaq along with spacs ipos stay-at-home stocks etc we will go through all the supporting facts for each trade throughout this video but today we also received more macroeconomics data supporting higher inflation we also had the coinbase ipo some will characterize the action for coinbase today as a success and describe the ipo as a hit but other will look at the price action today closing below the opening price by about 10 to 15 percent as a failure that will characterize the coinbase ipo as a flop once again we will go over all the facts and the implications if this is indeed a flop for coinbase ipo what are the implications here is this a sign of the absence and lack of participation from retail traders and if that is the case then what are the implications on other stocks that have been benefiting from the participation from retail traders and lastly today we also heard from the federal reserve chairman jerome powell in an interview and perhaps letting out more information than he's supposed to we will cover this and a lot more during the headlines of the day segment but for now let's start by covering the closing of the market and here we go 
the Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 54.68 points or a gain of 0.16%. The Nasdaq closing in the red down 138.26 points or a decline of about 1%. The S&P 500 closing in the red down 16.78 points or a decline of 0.41%. And what about the sector's performance for the day? leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal energy and coming up at number two for the silver materials and at number three for the bronze financials meanwhile the laggards of the day led by technology consumer cyclicals and real estate the inflationary trade outperforming today moving on to futures starting with crude oil both the WTI and crude oil Brent closing in the green with massive gains for about four and a half percent apiece what about softs once again strong gains led by sugar cotton lumber oj and coffee even coca managed to close slightly in the green and just a few days ago i opened positions in sugar and cotton futures based on a potential technical breakout and it's already playing as you can see what about metals futures gold retreating some of the gains it scored yesterday closing in the red by a little over half a percentage point Meanwhile, we have silver futures stable for the day, not moving one way or the other. We also saw declines for palladium and big gains for Dr. Copper, closing with gains of about 2% today. Likewise, we saw gains in platinum futures of about 1.5%. What about meats? The retreat for feeder and live cattle continues to go on, but here comes the new tech lane hogs rallying once again after consolidating for a few days what about grains big gains across the board whether we're talking about corn soybean oil wheat canola soybeans oats all closing in the green if you want to talk about a thupathacal the thupathacal is actually in commodities not in technology stocks commodities been rallying significantly since last year and in this channel we've been supporting an outlook for higher commodity prices due to the rise of inflation expectations from all of the spending that the Federal Reserve and the Federal Government have done. I am long sugar, cotton, copper, corn. Since last year, I've been buying corn continuously. I am long oats indirectly via Sun Opta. I've been buying Sun Opta since last year. The ticker is STKL. Wanted tickers? Here are our tickers. Moving on for more tickers to the big casino, the options market. Let's see what took place in the options market today. Leading the pack at number one, Apple, with about 1.3 million contracts. About 77% of those were calls. At number two, Palantir, with about 660,000 contracts. About 84% of those were calls. Palantir, up 9% yesterday. And all the bros messaged me, oh, you don't know about Palantir, bro. Palantir to the moon, you don't understand. And today, Palantir is down once again, more than 6%. How is this enjoyable? Up 9% a day then down six percent the day after how is this enjoyable why not just stick to solid strong balance sheet companies that will outperform in this upcoming macro environment and here we have a number three tesla with about four hundred and eighty five thousand contracts notice the drop last week we saw over 1 million contracts today we're seeing a drop in the volume for tesla by almost half and only about 56 percent of those were calls we also have kathy wood dumping tesla stock today to buy coinbase shares and that indeed did not help tesla shares today moving on to the unusual trades that took place in the options market today starting with the triple q's the nasdaq and this is a big one so pay attention put that coffee down because we have a bearish trade here by buying the 315 puts expiration date may 28th with expectations that the nasdaq will drop over six and a half percent by then and this trader paid three bucks and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 14 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker ebay for you guessed it 
eBay. They're making a bullish call here by buying the 68 calls, expiration date May 14th. With expectations that eBay will rise over 8% by then, they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1.7 million. What about the trade for the ticker AMD? For, you guessed it, AMD. This is a bearish bet by buying the 72.5 puts expiration date April 30th. With expectations that AMD will drop by over 8% by then, they paid about a buck and 10 cents apiece to enter this trade, which brought the total all the way to $1.5 million. What about the trade for the ticker Snow for Snowflake? Here we have a bullish bet by buying the 250 calls expiration date April 23rd. With expectations that the name will rise over 9% by then, they paid about 2 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1.4 million. What about this trade for the ticker left? For, you guessed it, left. This is a, yet again a bullish bet by buying the 72 and a half calls expiration date May 21st. With expectations that the name will rise over 15% by then. They managed to pay about one buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, the entry cost for this trade came up to be about $650,000. Moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with macro news. We are building up on the heels of the CPI report that we received yesterday. The CPI number shows increase in inflation, but not by much. Matter of fact, uh, the reference to food prices having increased only 0.1%. Again, do you believe this garbage? Because even other data from the Federal Reserve supports the notion that inflation is much higher than the CPI is letting out to be. Specifically here, we have the Atlanta Fed's sticky price CPI. It increased about 3.5% on an annualized basis in March. The flexible cut of the CPI increased 21.8% annualized. And this is the largest increase in about a decade. But hey, where is inflation? I don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't smell it. Where is inflation? Here is from The Economist, and they are now projecting that inflation will reach almost 4%. 4% by May, not by the end of the year by May. So once again, the party's coming to an end. The dance floor is getting very boring. There are a ton of bastards over there, and it's not fun anymore. Yet the Robin Hoodies and the likes, including their peers in institutional management, you know, because institutional management these days are even more crazy than the Robin Hoodies. The Robin Hoodies are holding the bag. Diamond Hands, bro. GME, AMC, Hertz. Palantir, Snowflake, Spax, Garbage, you get it. And these maniacs continue to dance, believing that the party will go on and on and on. Meanwhile, DJ Papa Jerome already prepared seats for the end of the musical games, and your name is not on one of these seats. The seats only have the names of Wall Street insiders. Those are the ones that Jerome will tip before starting tapering. We will get the news after the fact. And I have a statement from Jerome Powell himself admitting that he will taper before Treasury yields force him to do so. And why is this uh, inflation rising higher, by the way? What's going on with this invisible inflation? Well, the reason why it's uh, rising higher, because now we're seeing the impact of all of that tsunami of money supply that was unleashed from the printing machine on the economy last year and continues to be unleashed onto the economy. First, $2 trillion stimulus package. Now we have $2 trillion infrastructure package. And then we have another $2 trillion dollars in whatever the hell package and all of this stimulus and liquidity injected into global economies are now starting to show up in forms of excesses one of those excesses is personal income and personal income is rising globally you might say that this is good finally our incomes are rising but once again the rise in income did not come as a substitution for what was lost in wages for example, since the beginning of the pandemic, the total dollar amount of wages lost in this country amounted to about half a trillion 
dollars. We have spent over six trillion dollars to remedy a loss of less than half a trillion dollars in lost wages. Had we had an insurance program for wages, the total bill of weathering the storm could have been about one trillion dollars. Instead, we did an excess of over six trillion dollars. Now this money is showing up in excess personal income and that personal income is creating pent-up demand for the goods and services once the economy is reopened and therefore pushing inflation expectations higher. In addition, the supply chain is not kicking on full gear yet to meet all of this demand and therefore when you have so many hands chasing very few goods, that is a classic recipe for higher inflation. And that in turn is pushing commodity prices higher. We talked about the super cycle of commodities, chiefly copper. I've been bullish copper since last year arguing that copper prices will go higher and I did buy Freeport McMoran stock the ticker FCX and here we have Goldman Sachs finally catching up and saying that copper is the new oil and they are raising the price forecast to about 11,000 per metric ton calling copper the new oil and a replacement for gold and this is coming from Goldman Sachs they have a bias by nature and they are saying that copper is the new oil copper is the new gold we also have inflation in cotton prices due to the shortage of supply from the boycotts against China's Xinjiang region. And it's not just lumber, copper, cotton, and other commodity prices rising higher. We also talked about shipping rates rising higher, and that is contributing to higher import prices. U.S. import prices increased solidly, seen temporarily boosting inflation. Of course, now the business media, you know, you guys got to be careful here because you could get banned from our tech overlords if you use the word inflation, but specifically the S word, you know, uh, stagflation. And here we have the business media, even when they talk about inflation, they have to add the word temporary, transitory. Folks, you're not allowed to raise inflation expectations. How dare you? You don't comply and go against the wishes of the Federal Reserve. And here we have another example of an import that will definitely increase in prices, French wine. A devastating frost has affected 80% of vineyards in France's primary wine growing areas, according to the European Committee of Wine Companies. In addition, we still have tariffs against imported wine and cheese from France that will add more and more to the prices of French wine. Now, this is not a necessity, but it is yet an example that we have multiple factors pushing inflation higher. And here, perhaps, we have the next bomb, the housing bubble and housing prices because for now we have a moratorium against evictions but you have all of these bills the missed rents racking up and a one-time 1400 bucks stimulus is not going to do it for most people who are behind on paying the rent and therefore we're about to see an eviction tsunami that will add more to the homelessness problem we have in this country now, with the current adaption of MMT by the Federal Reserve and the federal government, rest assured that they will intervene and will not allow an eviction storm to take place. And they will print more money, more stimulus, more hands outs, and more and more inflation. Once again, this is a zombified economy hooked on steroids. And the steroid is fiscal and monetary liquidity. Removing those and the economy will collapse in a second. And therefore, you have to continue to hit the market and the economy with more and more cocaine, fiscal and monetary liquidity. The problem is for the market, removing monetary liquidity by tapering will have to happen to control inflation because the Federal Reserve will have two difficult choices. Number one, sacrifice the economy to please the markets or sacrifice the markets to please the economy. And therefore, if the price to pay is tapering the monetary liquidity and crashing the markets, while we still have a floating, quote unquote, floating economy from all of that stimulus, then be it, crash the market. And therefore, do not put your trust on the Federal Reserve. Papa Jerome will have to deal you the bad card. 
it's not a choice anymore because we have another bomb coming here in the next jobs report because JP Morgan are now expecting that the economy will create over 1 million jobs in the month of April. Matter of fact, it could be as high as 1.6 million jobs. And if that is the case and we receive a very hard jobs report, for the month of April of say 1 million or more jobs created on top of the jobs created in the March report then the Federal Reserve will have no choice to start thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about tapering and raising interest rates again go back to my Biden stocks video I told you that the Biden administration policies economic policies in addition to the Federal Reserve's policies will be very good for the economy but very bad for for the stock market and the reason is they will let the economy overheat because they believe an overheating economy will recover more jobs and finally fix the gender and racial inequality etc etc and therefore they will sacrifice the stock market in favor of a potential a hope a dream that a very hot inflation and a very hot economy will finally fix society's woes. Why is that? A hot economy with higher inflation will force the Federal Reserve to taper at some point and the market will react way earlier before the Federal Reserve actually starts tapering. Meaning, folks, the party's over. Are you listening? Or are you shaking it off? Because for all we know, the Federal Reserve is indeed shaking it off. Because according to their own metric from the mouthpiece James Bullard, who said if we reach 75% vaccination rate in the United States, we will start tapering. Well, here we have the outlook for vaccinations and we will reach the 75% threshold by as early as this summer. So once again, this whole not thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking is actually bullshit. The Federal Reserve will be forced to taper as soon as this year. You can bet. And of course, for now, they continue to deny, 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 deceive, distort, and issue dumb statements. The Fed is more worried about inflation running too cold than too hot. Yeah, where is inflation? Huh? Where is it right here? Is it there? Where is inflation? And notice the psychological tactics that Chairman Jerome Powell has to resort to when talking about inflation and the economic recovery. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell sees, quote unquote, faster growth and job creation. So Jerome, what do you say? Inflation is uh, rising higher? Oh, but, 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 you got to negate it. The main risk is that we'll have another spike talking about COVID cases. He has to throw cold water right away after telling you that inflation is rising higher. And then he started slipping a little bit. Perhaps the weed started to kick in. And he said that he does not believe that the Federal Reserve would ever sell bonds into the market. Oh, Okay, why are you mentioning this, Mr. Powell? Because nobody brought it up. Mm. Once again, attempting to manipulate the bonds market via psychology. It's not working so far, but perhaps this is the big one. And this is what started to upset the market today. Mr. Powell says he will taper before raising rates, meaning that he is saying if inflation gets out of hand, the first step will be cutting the cocaine operation of buying bonds and assets. Now we know that the market is, say it with me, a cocaine addict. What is the cocaine? Fiscal and monetary liquidity. And in this case, the Federal Reserve is saying we will start by cutting the cocaine. That in turn will push treasury yields significantly higher and it will be just a matter of time before they do the inevitable, raising interest rates. And as the interview started to progress, you know, they started uh, asking Mr. Powell the hard-pressing, hard-heading questions. Like, for example, uh, tell us about your biking habits, Mr. Powell. And he said, fed chair or not fed chair. You don't want to get hit by a car. These are your beloved and trusted journalists, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the market started throwing a mini fit after all of this talk about tapering and whatnot. But rest assured, we have Vice Chairman Clarida to the rescue. And Chairman Clarida, before the market closes, issued a statement saying the policy will not tighten because unemployment falls below the natural level. Meaning, Mr. Clarida is saying, look, April's jobs report will be hot, hot, hot. But don't panic. 
Please don't push those interest rates on the treasury yields higher. Please don't do that. Because even if you do that, we will not tighten. We're tough. We're going to stand our ground. And uh, Jerome had a few cocktails, though. So don't take what he said seriously. We're not going to taper. We're not going to tighten. We're not going to do anything. And look at Steve Leesman's face. He's already having an orgasm wetting his pants, reading the monitor. But can you take uh, Mr. Clarida's assurances? For real? Is that the only threat for the market? Tightening monetary policy? Nope. We also have higher taxes to come. Why is that? Because here is the budget deficit. Just take a look at this stunning jaw-dropping chart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the largest budget deficit ever in history. And somebody got to pay for that. If the Fed is going to taper and the easy money policy is going to start to go away, then paying for that has to come from quote-unquote revenue for the federal government, meaning taxes, meaning that your taxes are going higher and corporate taxes are going higher. I don't want to hear from the donkeys saying that, oh, we will just uh, price in higher taxes. You can't price that shit in. This is a mathematical formula. Raising taxes will cut corporate margins and in return will cut corporate valuations, meaning that the stock market is not a buy here. It's a musical chairs game and the music will stop and we will see a severe correction and we will not go back and trade at the top from which we started correcting perhaps for years to come. Moving on to market sentiment news, starting with what else? the 21st century's tulip mania. We had the Coinbase IPO today, and we have all the Bitcoin bulls out of the woods talking about their pornographic price predictions. And here we have uh, Novogratz, and he is saying that Bitcoin value is only a fraction of global wealth, about 2% meaning that we have 98% uh, to go, so you have to be bullish on Bitcoin. If that is the case, then uh, horse manure is only about half a percent of global wealth, meaning that we have 99.5% to go. So should we put our blindfolds on and go all in, heads first, Naruto style, buying horse manure? And here is the Coinbase IPO. It was, to a certain extent, a success because the opening price was much, much higher than the suggested price we got last night of about 250. The stock opened almost at 400. And the valuation for Coinbase reached about $100 billion. But hey, that's nothing in uh, this current market mania. Anything can be worth $100 billion. It's a good entry price, bro. Meanwhile, the only people benefiting from this market mania are insiders who got in the trade a lot sooner. Because when you buy at $100 billion valuation, what are you expecting? It's going to double to $200 billion? Is it easier for a company with a valuation of $5 billion to double to $10 billion? Or is it easier for a company that is worth $100 billion to double to $200 billion, specifically when that particular company doesn't have the supporting fundamentals? Where is your head? And here we go, Nas. Rapper Nas is one of the early investors in Coinbase. And he is now worth his stake, by the way. He's probably worth more than that. But his stake is worth $200 million. You think uh, NAS is not going to dump? Look at this mania, $100 billion valuation. We hit the jackpot. Time to cash out. Meanwhile, the zombies are chasing these prices higher and higher and higher. We're the captain of the ship now. We are the smartest generation of investors. <laughs> Palantir to the moon, bro. And once this whole bubble busts, and the movie is over, we have to choose a book cover for the upcoming documentary about this bubble. And I am leaning toward this with the chef Guy Fieri saying Dogecoin to the moon. This is perhaps a clear illustration of this massive insane mania. And of course, uh, Coinbase early investors are dumping the future bro, you know, Bitcoin, in exchange of uh, that useless uh, old fiat currency, you know, the US dollar. All of a sudden, the cryptomaniacs want to cash into that useless fiat currency. If you are Bitcoin bull, shouldn't you hold forever to the moon, bro? Or perhaps even the insiders are reading the warning signals. Of course, they're not going to tell you that. They're going to go on CNBC and sell you the scam, but they, they will be cashing in because the underlying assets that make up Coinbase's financial story are unpredictable. Fundamental analysis of earnings quality, customer retention, and efficiency doesn't get you very far. Coinbase evangelists don't spend much time on it and therefore saying that the valuation for this particular company coinbase will be extremely volatile because the underlying assets making up the valuations are very volatile 
themselves. Even though Coinbase revenue surged over the past 12 months, the company has little to no chance of meeting the future profit expectations that are baked into its ridiculously expected high valuation for $100 billion. Meaning if you buy now, the valuation of the company will never be justified because you're buying 10 to 20 years worth of growth now. This is a good deal for angel investors the likes of NAS, but it is a shitty deal for us retail traders to hop in this trade. And I know the IPO will rebound higher and people will chase it and they will feel like a bunch of geniuses for the next five minutes and then it will go down crashing and they will lose their money because the fundamentals were never there. And here is another threat. Coinbase CEO says regulations or regulation is one of the biggest threats to crypto. Okay, here comes regulations. As Coinbase debuts, Powell, this is a Papa Jerome, calls cryptocurrencies quote unquote vehicles for speculation. And here we have the new SEC boss, Gary Gensler, and he is already confirmed by the Senate. So you're afraid of regulation? Here comes regulation. But once again, the 21st century's tulip mania is yet another illustration of the tsunami of money supply that was unleashed last year. The unneeded, unwarranted tsunami of money supply. When there is money floating all over the place, you gotta find some stores of value because you're not gonna hold that that money in cash. Cash is trash, remember? So we have to chase equity prices. Equity prices are now elevated. All right, we're gonna move to commodities. Commodities prices are now elevated to the moon. We're gonna search for another thing. Here comes crypto, Bitcoin, tulips, shoes, garbage, horse manure, doesn't matter. Anything, any store of value we're ready to buy because there is a tsunami of money all over the place that has to be stored somewhere. And therefore, they're storing money even in assets that are guaranteed to decline. Investors are pouring money into bonds backed by U.S. office buildings. Even as analysts expect office demand to fall anywhere from 10% to 31% in upcoming years. We are desperate for stores of value. Even if it means GameStop. GameStop leads quote-unquote stonks higher. This is, by the way, Reuters business. This is what they're writing right now. Are we in a bubble or not? Because we are choosing very volatile, risky, and proven assets to store value, whether they're GameStop or Tulips. And that money is not just uh, our money that we own already, but we're also going all in, Naruto style, heads first to the slaughter, by margin borrowing. As if the blow up of Arcago's capital did not phase you, here is the chart of margin debt to GDP. And we have the highest reading ever in history. And every time we had high elevated readings of margin debt to GDP ratio that was followed up by a severe market crash, meaning that we have a market crash imminent. And what you saw with Arcago's capital is just the tip of the iceberg. But hey, we have the good professor from Wharton, Professor Jeremy Siegel. And the good professor is a very nice man, so we don't want to be mean to him. But he is a perma bull because he is a paid propagandist for Wall Street. And he is bullish regardless. Whether we have pandemics, nuclear wars, asteroids, extension of humanity, it doesn't matter. The good professor will always be bullish. And our rumor has it that the good professor gives uh, straight A's as if he's giving candy. All you have to do during the final examination is to take the paper, rip it off, and hand the good professor a sticky note that says, Stonks only go up. And you're going to get an A plus guaranteed. Enjoy this ride, says Jeremy Siegel of Wharton School of Business. Says the stock market could go up 30% before the boom ends. So once again, Professor Siegel is saying it is indeed a game of musical chairs, but continue to dance because I got 30% more for you before the music stops. Now, can you trust the good professor? Put your blindfold on, go back to the blackjack table because we have 30% left. Well, let's review the history of the predictions from the good professor. April 1999. Are internet stocks overvalued? Question mark. Are they ever? By Jeremy Siegel, professor of finance from Wharton School of Business. And we know that a year later, the dot-com bubble busted. What about 2008? My forecast for 2008 by Jeremy Siegel. Don't count on a recession, but look for stocks to have a good year with Democrats to take control of the White House. We know what happened right away. The biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. And perhaps you want to hear this, so pay attention and put that coffee 
down because this is from 2008 and perhaps it will strike some uh, similarities with what we're going through right now. Jeremy Siegel on the financial crisis. This is March 2008. The Fed did in its statement acknowledge that there were inflationary pressures, but it did not elevate inflation as a problem equal to the problem of growth. And I think that both are problems at the present time. So we are going to have to see how that plays out and whether commodities are going to continue their ride upward. It was broken yesterday, but without the Feds coming out strong against inflation, we're going to be watching those commodity prices, and that's going to be important. If they go back down, it's going to be all right. But if they continue to go upward, that will be a problem. Sounds familiar? And we know how that movie ended. More in sentiment news. We have clown Dan Ivis, you know, of the super thank you. And he says, in our opinion, the secular tech winners and poised are poised to move much higher for the rest of the year with Q1 earnings a quote-unquote major show-me moment for the tech space and should put fuel back in the multi-year upward tech rally. Three favorite names are Microsoft, Apple, and Zscaler. Now, I will let you in an insider thing here, that this clown is paid and sponsored by technology companies. What he does is he throws tickers for you, in this case, Microsoft, Apple, and Zscaler. Out of the blue, Zscaler next to Apple and Microsoft. What is uh, Thupa Thankel? is trying to say. He is trying to tell you that there is pending news regarding Zscaler, favorable news, whether it is an acquisition from a bigger company or whatever. Because uh, Thupa Thankel issued almost an identical tweet last week saying that he is bullish on Apple, Microsoft, and Nuance. And right away, we heard the news about Microsoft acquiring Nuance, and the shares blasted higher. So is uh, Thupa Thankel saying that Zscaler will have similar news? He's just issuing a riddle for you. More in sentiment news. You know your uh, beloved politicians over in uh, DC, they're working hard, right? Probably not because they are gambling in the casino via options trading. And we know that uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, is a notorious options gambler. Famously, she has uh, Tesla call options, the 600 call options, expiring 2022. So if you dislike Nancy, you might want to join the revolution, join the bear camp of Tesla, and hope that the stock will crash and trade under 600 by 2021 so Nancy would lose her money. And here we have Nancy betting millions of dollars and she bought call options ahead of the announcement of Microsoft's contract with the Pentagon. We cover the options market, the unusual activities every single day and we spotted two large Microsoft call options trades right before the announcement of the contract. I'm assuming that one of those was Nancy Pelosi. So should we crash Microsoft too? Anyways, lastly on sentiment news, let's finish up with a positive note. A note of sanity. Investors now flocking back to quality, strong balance sheet companies outperforming weaker counterparts since early March. Reversing trend in place since late last year, meaning that last year was the year of the Robin Hood yet. This year is the year of Berkshire Hathaway. When did we see that dynamic last time? Yep. You guessed it, right before the dot-com bubble crash. Berkshire Hathaway value stocks, strong balance sheets started outperforming the mania names of the dot-com bubble month before the crash. Are you paying attention or not? I had a lot of uh, corporate specific news for you, but since these videos are coming late, the last couple of weeks, because I have work being done in my house, and for the interest of time, we are skipping corporate news, but we will revisit them tomorrow. Moving on to the heat map analysis, and let's take a look at the market and what it did today. The theme is abundantly clear. We are back at favoring the inflationary trade at least for today. At performance from financials on the heels of JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs earnings, both stunningly impressive. Likewise, we saw an ad performance from uh, materials. Massive gains for names like Freeport McMoran, FCX up over 7.5%. Big gains for steel, US Steel, the ticker X, closing the day with gains over 7%. Likewise, we saw energy stocks at performing with names like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, British Petroleum, even the high beta names in the energy sector outperforming today. What did not outperform is yesterday's theme of the stay-at-home trade. We have Zoom down about 4%, Peloton also down 
around 4%. Likewise, we saw a retreat for the gains in the mania names, the high multiple names, whether we're talking about Tesla, Neo, Shopify, Nvidia, Palantir, Square, all with massive losses today. In addition to a retreat for the recent winners in big cap technology stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon. And the reason is money has to be taken out to fund purchasing Coinbase IPO. The problem is, was the IPO successful or was it a bust? Because there are a lot of people who bought at 4 420, 400, sold their Apple, their Microsoft, even their Teslas, and they bought Coinbase at 420, 400, 390, and we know that the stock closed much lower than that. Now, the stock could pop back tomorrow, but the activities from the first day of trading can tell us a lot about the sentiment and the momentum for this IPO. It is a little disappointing, not by much, but there is a disappointment there. We had every tailwind for the Coinbase IPO to close sizably in the green. That did not happen. The selling pressure overwhelmed the buying pressure once trading opened. Moving on to the themes analysis. Let's see how the different themes in the market perform today starting with the reopening trade and forgive the mistake in not coloring the gains and the losses here they're all in red but all in all we saw a mixed picture in the reopening trade pretty much muted no significant activities one way or the other meaning no sell-off no exit from the reopening trade what about the inflationary trade also mixed picture muted no significant activities one way or the other meaning the trade is still intact and there is no exit from these names to say buy coinbase ipo now let's contrast that with the deflationary trade and the picture is very clear specifically for the mania slash high beta names within the deflationary trade. We saw big losses, whether we're talking about Zoom, Peloton, Shopify, Square, DoorDash, even Nvidia, taking the recent gains and rotating them to Coinbase. Now, one thing to mention here is, I showed you the margin debt chart. This is a highly levered market. One of these IPOs could break the market if we see a mass exodus from one stock that happens to be very popular with family offices, hedge funds that happen to be highly levered, because that could trigger a a margin called tsunami we're not here yet but it could happen just a little something to watch out for moving on to the charts analysis starting with the 30 minutes chart of the spy what do we see here we saw a slight reversal not a significant one and i have the fibonacci zones for you to illustrate that we are still in a bullish trend however it is not out of the norm to go all the way back to say 407 retouch and we check that level for support and then bouncing higher once again the move is very extended as of now and it needs to take a break and search for a level of support what about the continuous contract the daily chart once again the volume is slightly elevated today and it is elevated on a move downward meaning that while we did not see conviction in the buying the last few days matter of fact the last couple of weeks perhaps we will start to see conviction in the move downward confirmed with higher volume what are we looking for here if we go down in the s&p 500 futures we do have the weird gap that has to be closed at some point that could be destination one we could go all the way back this is the preferred way, by the way, if you are a bull in the market, you want to go all the way down to 3960, recheck that line for support and then bounce higher because we are overextended from an RSI perspective. What about the Q's 30 minutes perspective? We are still on a bullish breakout. However, it is starting to look very extended and showing signs of exhaustion. The series of bull flags is leaving many gaps to be filled on the downside side we have the center of gravity at 323 now here's another way to look at the chart from a 30 minutes perspective are we seeing a head and shoulder formation that should lead us to the downside we know that the chart is extended for now and it is looking for a break what about the continuous contract of the nasdaq a daily perspective we do have a reversal it is not definitive yet it is looking for a confirmation but once again i told you we have to pay 13,900 the respect that that level deserves you can't just blast above it in one day you gotta spend time building the energy building the support 
before breaking above 13,900. This is not just a regular level. This is the previous all-time highs. It holds a lot of waiting. Now, if we start trending lower, what do we have to look down to? 13,599, which happens to coincide with the purple trend line. That would be a retest level to recheck for support. But once again, the move downward today came with higher volume than the last few days. So the move downward has a lot more conviction in it than the move higher. Moving on to the IWM. We talked about the tame activities and the weakness in the IWM. We still have the gap at around 218 that is yet to be filled. We opened another gap today, creating a bull flag formation. Why did that happen? The outperformance of GameStop. Once again, the IWM, the Russell 2000, has become a meme ETF, a meme index. And the reason is the waiting of GameStop. GameStop blasted higher today, taking the IWM the Russell 2000 up with it. But the question is, did we do any technical repairs for the bearish formation, at least from a daily perspective in the rut, the Russell 2000? The answer is not really. The bearish formation remains on the table because the line in the sand is 2,264. You gotta close above that level from a weekly perspective. For now, the Russell 2000 is still struggling and we still have negative divergence in the RSI. Moving on to the dollar index. What's going on here? Lots of weakness, but the bullish trend remains intact until and unless we start making lower lows. Now, we could bounce from here, creating a head and shoulder formation and then diving lower. So perhaps the majority of the gains from this bullish trend higher in the US dollar that started all the way back since the beginning of the year is already behind us. Moving on to gold. What's going on here? Gold still struggling to break above 1750 the US dollar trending down. Yields very calm, not shooting to the upside. So what is gold waiting for? What will get gold to start to rally? Because now it's starting to look a little pathetic. You look at Bitcoin, yes, it is volatile, but it is trending higher and higher by the day. Under all of this uh, high inflation expectations, gold is not outperforming. But once again, that begs the question, is gold no longer a reliable hedge against inflation? At least this is what I think, because the recent correlation is inverse between gold and the 10-year treasury yield. Moving on to Bitcoin, what's going on here? We are trending higher in momentum when it comes to the MACD indicator and the RSI. We took a little break today, but the trend remains higher. We don't have any reversals. We don't have any warning signals. The trend remains higher for Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin is gonna surge higher, you might see a recovery for Coinbase stock tomorrow. What about yields? Yields stable and bouncing slightly from the level I identified for for you at around 1.6 percent now the challenge for yields is not to make lower lows because doing so will confirm a reversal and we will go down all the way to one and a half percent now with all of the inflation data we've been receiving recently it is just a matter of time before yields start to trend higher once again so far it has been consolidating if there was a deflationary risk as the geniuses have been saying then yields should have retreated a lot lower that is not happening and what about the tlt nothing happened today stable you have to look at 139 and 134 and a half closing below 134 and a half is a confirmation for much lower prices to come closing above 139 for the week is an indicator that we have higher prices in the tlt and yields will retreat a lot lower perhaps all the way to one and a half percent what about the vix the vix showing signs of life the market is becoming very bloated and ready for a pullback and therefore the vix is charging for what for that move all the way to try and challenge the resistance now at 20 which was the support for a very long time going all the way back to last year there is a higher move in the vix and today i loaded once again on calls for vix proxies what about apple apple an impressive rally as of late but it is showing signs of overextension and exhaustion we have 131 as the center of gravity we have many gaps to fill here and it is looking very identical to the q's chart perhaps we're seeing a head and shoulder formation from a 30 minutes perspective we will see apple going back at least to 131 but once you break the support of 131 then you are going back all the way to 125 to close some of those gaps so once again the bulk of the gains in my opinion in the recent bounce higher for apple 
is behind us, and it is time to book profits and perhaps start switching bets to the downside for Apple to retreat at least all the way back to 128. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle. What's going on here? Impressive week for the souffle so far, but it's not going to go in a straight line throughout the week. We need pullbacks, and today it was a pullback day, a reversal day. Why do we say that? Because the target for the gap was 781.30. Tesla went all the way there, but reversed before closing the gap. This is an ominous reversal signal, and it came with higher volume than average. Therefore, perhaps the move in uh, Tesla, whether when you call it a bull flag breakout or an ABC pattern, it doesn't matter. It already played out, reached the destination, and now we have to switch bets playing that Tesla will go down to close some gaps and catch support from a certain level. What would that level be? How about 720? That is the first level we're going to look for. And then we have 679. That is the important number. Tesla must not close below that number for the week now tesla has upcoming earnings so we're not expecting a massive move one way or the other before earnings we're gonna wait for earnings but the beauty in that is that the implied volatility for tesla options will start to heat up once again meaning you gotta start reserving your seat right now regardless of what your bet is up or down because right now the options are very cheap, as cheap as they can be anyways. But as we start getting closer to earnings, those premiums will start to pick up. Now, we played Tesla trades in the last two earnings for the last two quarters. In both trades, the bet was to use the elevated premiums to raise cash. And in both trades, I managed to score massive gains from those trades. So let's hope for a third time is a charm and I will announce the trade for Tesla in the coming few days. The goal is to utilize the rise of implied volatility and premiums in our favor. With that being said, moving on to conclude this video. What do we have in the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the second most important day. We had the CPI on Tuesday, tomorrow, Thursday, April 15th. We have a slew of economic data with major implications for inflation expectations chiefly retail sales and the philly and empire state manufacturing indices and then we have more banks earnings specifically bank of america and citibank and of course uh, you better hope that we see a pullback in bank of america and if we do see that indeed that will be an opportunity to buy depending on how severe the pullback is and how good the earnings report looks now, the stock could react positively as we saw today with Goldman Sachs, but just in case the stock goes down, the macro outlook is extremely favorable for banks and financial stocks. So you have to be writing a list here on which names you want to buy. If you see pullbacks, you should be starting to think about opening positions in these names. For now, I'm in Goldman Sachs and U.S. Bank, but soon enough, I might be in Bank of America too. Anyways, we'll take it one day at a time. I do expect the work going on in my home right now to be paused in the next few days and that will give me an opportunity to upload these videos for you earlier but for those who stuck with me watching these videos late or the next day thank you for being very patient and i appreciate your viewership thank you very much that's all i got for you tonight and i will talk to you again tomorrow